The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey there, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayat, your podcast host. Big thanks to Uka the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to another action-packed, fun-filled, rip-roaring, high-flying, jet-setting, bed-wetting <laughs> good time. And that one got away from me a little bit. I tried the Ric Flair intro, and uh, they don't always work out. But hey, I gave it I gave it the solid shot. Today I talked to Justin Koch, who is a, uh, a writer who worked on a book, a new book he has coming out called SWAT, which uh, is being crowdfunded through Zoop. And uh, we talk about that during the show. You'll get all the details in there. But it looks super cool. I ordered my copy. I hope you ordered yours after listening. Uh, you know, guys like this that have this passion, this deep passion for their work, um, you know, this is infectious. It's uh, as anybody who's tried to do anything creative, I find that talking to other folks that are passionate about their creations really kind of kind of jacks you up. It gets you a little surge. It gets you a little interested in creating uh, and getting out there and doing your own thing. So uh, if you find that as well, this will be the podcast for you. This episode will get you charged, amped up, and ready to work on that project you've been putting off. Uh, yeah, great talk, great chat with Justin. Um, we had, we we talk uh, we dip into politics just a bit. Not something I generally try to talk about. It does come out sometimes just because, you know, artistic people are usually pretty passionate and usually wear their their heart and their sleeves as it were and sometimes that bleeds through with their political opinions as well and uh, you know sometimes it just comes out in the conversation i mean there's a lot going on in the states uh, a lot of divisive stuff going on especially with the attempted assassination on uh, donald trump's life which is insane but uh you know that's that's the world we're living in now uh, insane is a is a daily event uh, you know, I kind of, I don't know what politician it was or somebody, it might have been John Stewart actually, that said it like politics should be boring, like we shouldn't be excited, amped up uh, by politics, but uh, you know, it's politics and entertainment have become hand in hand now, and that's the world we're living in. I mean, Canada's going through its own little thing coming up, but probably having an election soon, likely new prime minister, not one I necessarily agree with, but that's the way the chips fall. Uh, one thing that a lot of people like to do in my area, well, in Canada in general, is fly flags that say uh, fuck Trudeau, uh, who is our prime minister, if you're, if you're not aware. And, uh, yeah, I find it's like the ultimate temper tantrum. It's like, uh, you know, uh, no, uh, the person I voted for didn't win, and I'm very upset about that, so I'm going to yell it to the world. And it's just, you know, vote again when the election comes up. And uh, I'm certainly not going to fly a, a fuck whatever prime minister is up that I don't like that's, you know, but that's just... That's just my take on it. That's, you know, politics play a huge part in people's lives. And sometimes I often wonder, uh, I, I just can't expel the mental energy required to be that passionate about something like that. I mean, you, you know, you, we all have access to the same information. Do the research, vote for your candidate. If they don't win, try again next time. That's how it works. But uh, hopefully it didn't alienate any money. I mean, if you're flying a fuck Trudeau flag or a, or a, a sticker on your car, just know I laugh when I see it. That's all. Uh, no judgments. I just, I just kind of laugh because it's, it's, it's dumb. <laughs> Moving along, a few of you have mentioned that you noticed uh, the cat cry at the end of the <laughs> the UFP uh, kind of outro that we have, and that is Lebowski. If you're paying attention, so he's my cat. He's the orange and white one. He's my boy. He's at my feet right now, just showing out. And uh, yeah, I figured it's important to make him make him a part of the show, as he is a very big part of my life and a very cute little guy. Um, yeah, and things are rolling along well. We're, we're gearing in on episode 100. Not sure. I have a, a vague inclination who that's going to be, which I'm pretty excited about. Hopefully, you uh, when that that announcement comes, you will be too. But it'd be very very cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, excited to drop that when that information comes. But you know, we don't need to talk all day about politics, about future episodes, about. You know, uh, where where to find the best mustard at the grocery store. I'm not sure why I brought that one up. Uh, this, is a, this is a conversation podcast, so let's get to a conversation. In this one, I talk with Justin 
Koch, who uh, is the creator of SWAT, as I mentioned before. Very cool book, uh, very infectious creative spirit, and uh, hopefully you enjoy this chat as much as I had enjoyed doing it. So uh, here it is, my talk with Justin Koch. Yeah, yeah, know it's yeah, it's uh, just been kind of a shitty fucking week, right? Oh, really? Well, I mean, in general. National. Oh, I suppose. Yeah, where where are you calling in from? Columbia, Missouri. Ah, uh, okay, cool. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not. I it's personal, but I just I had a lot of crap. I don't know, it's been a very frustrating year for me. Yeah. So on the political front. Well, in the comic front and the. Like Google froze the ads on my business for three months. Really? For, and the, yeah, for verification. And then they kept rejecting it and would never tell me what was wrong. And then they'd be like, it's nine days. We have some sort of technical issue on our side. It'll be nine business days. So I'm basically been fucking unemployed for two months. Jesus. Like almost, you know, and then there, there's that. There's the, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm dumping <laughs> on you. It's quite all right, man. No worries at all. Like this is all sort of just to get to know you. And, you know, the shit you're dealing with is a big part of the you you wear, right? Yeah. 100%. So are you from Missouri? Pretty much. I mean, um, yeah, I've lived here since I was like three. So effectively. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, 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 did you, uh, like, what were your folks, what did your folks do? Uh, my dad was a banker. My mom was an un- uh, house housewife, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just did that for a while, and uh, they're retired now. But no, it's mostly Missouri, you know, which is fine. You know, I love Columbia; it's a lot better than I grew up in Joplin, which is the kind of town where um, there's a white supremacist donut shop there that doesn't serve black people. <laughs> oh my god, really? <laughs> no, I, I believe it. Uh, I'm I'm in Canada. Um, I'm in Nova yeah. Scotia, so. Um... My my frame of reference for the states, I've only been to like New York and Florida and uh, uh, Vegas. So it's not like I, I don't have a, a sweeping swath of of knowledge yeah. of, of the country. Uh, but I have been to Vancouver, which is very similar to Seattle. It's just above it. So yeah. uh, you know, I get I get some some general vibes about how uh, how the areas are. But I'd like to see more of it. I mean, it's such a like America to me is such um, like every state is like a mini country, right? Like that's how it's run. That's why it's the United States. And then yeah. there are, but then there's so many varying like temperature and like, you know, areas like, you know, between the whole country, like our country's fairly similar all the way from one end to the other. You guys mm-hmm. had these like swaths of desert, swaths of tropical areas, places just like mine, just depends on where you go. And it's just such an expansive, like Canada's expansive, but we're all mostly near the border. So yeah. it's generally stays about the same, but you guys are just so spread out. It's crazy. Yeah, I was actually, I, I went up to Canada for a fishing trip. Nice. And I was kind of surprised by how it just sort of felt like Missouri, honestly, in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, people are people regardless of where you go, but it's, uh, yeah. especially in our sort of neck of the woods that, you know, America is, is not very far from Canada, obviously. And, uh, and, um, they, uh, yeah, so, but Missouri, that's interesting. So, uh, a white supremacist donut. What was the name of this donut shop? Do you remember? I never actually, it, it started after I lived there. I don't uh, remember what it was called. Uh, but yeah, it got knocked down by the tornado. And I don't know if you remember in 2010 that Joplin got nailed by a massive tornado. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they they rebuilt it. That's how much people liked the white supremacist donut shop. So, oh, that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad I'm, Columbia is so much cooler. Um, mm it's way 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 better it's a university town and stuff so it's it's as little like being in missouri as possible while being in missouri that yeah makes sense. a little more of a, a left-leaning bend at least or at least yeah. a more liberal uh, way of approaching things yeah um and that's that's to me is another aspect of that because like i i couldn't imagine and, and not to generalize american living but the idea that like a business could operate in that way you know just a free, oh, no, friendly it's totally legal it's yeah. just no one's doing anything about it. Oh, that's what I mean. Like in the community, it's like, well, we like we we miss this so much when it got destroyed, we want this back. 
And uh, it makes me wonder how much is just people that, you know, agree with them, how much are just people that really like their donuts, how much are people that, you know, somewhere in between. It's no, just such a wild concept. I, I don't know how good the donuts would have to be for me to overlook that. Yeah, that's what I mean, right? But, that, but there are some people that, and that that's maybe a bigger political discussion is that like indifference is such a bigger, like people think you're either pro or anti, but then there's this huge middle piece of indifference, which is like, I don't care. It doesn't affect me. I don't know. Or I'm not getting involved. And uh, like, that's a massive part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it probably is. Well, yeah. And I mean, right now with everything going on in your neck of the woods, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting when your election comes up. We'll see. Yeah. 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 Hmm. So uh, were you like a comic fan growing up all, all the all the while? Yeah. I mean, I, I was really into the newspaper comic fa- uh, page. And mm-hmm. then, um, you know, like I had the uh, Archie omnibuses they sold at grocery stores and stuff like that uh my access to comics is pretty much the the wire rack at the smitty's grocery store so i didn't actually get that far into it because it was way too expensive for mm-hmm. what it was right like i could either buy a paperback book for 425 this is way back uh or buy two comics that would entertain me for the ride home right mm-hmm. so but i really like it i got way i got back into it pretty recently and I mean, I love Sandman in high school, but uh, I got back into it about three years ago and started writing them. And it was like a right. It's like I, I should have been doing that the whole time. I realize that now. Like I've got like ten novels that I wrote, and they should have just been comics. Really? I mean, conceptually, they they fit in perfectly with the comic world of just being off the wall nuts in a way that you know uh, I don't think. Enough. Like one thing I wrote was uh, Frankenstein and Captain Ahab, the monster teaming up. That's in awesome. A stellar uh, Lovecraftian universe to fight evil and shit, which is an amazing comic. It's really kind of hard to pull off as a novel. I think you know people are just like, no. whereas in the comics world, people get it. You know, yeah, like the 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 Alan Moore approach, like the League of Strange Gentlemen. It, it makes it a little easier when you see them all together. You know, drawn in the way they're drawn, then to try to like combine the narrative. I, I I feel like with books. There's like maybe it maybe it's just me, but I, I tend to read them like if it was a mashup like that, I, the style of each of them, the books are so different. Like to try to think of like the Moby Dick style approach to how that book is written on top of you know the Mary Shelley Frankenstein play. Yeah, or, yeah. I mean, if you wrote realistic dialogue for those two, it would be absolutely unbearable. <laughs> um, There's so a lot I, of a lot of shake, like quoting Milton at each other. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, was, it's, it would be so, so bad. I, I just, I said, fuck all that and just wrote them like they were, you know, mm-hmm. basically from Missouri, I guess. <laughs> so, well, do you uh, find that like, as far as like, cause comics offer a far more outward, you know, it's a less internal dialogue as you get to see the, it's not just your ma- imagination, like filling in the gaps, the, the literal depictions are, are doing that for you. So yeah, do you find I, it easier? I, it's so much easier to draw it and people will get it. Whereas you might have to spend 500 words trying to explain how it would work Mm. in prose, but you can just draw it and then people just get it, you know, and, uh, and the comics in general just seems to really uh, treasure sort of being out there, right. Just going balls out. And I really enjoy that. You know, a lot of fun. Um, I never, I, I, I hadn't really discovered the indie comic scene until, until recently and then i just walked into distant planet which is the store here in columbia and just started i bought harrow county like the mm-hmm. giant library editions and was just blown away and that was kind of my reintroduction um because i thought sandman i mean i thought the comics were pretty much just sandman and the watchman right and then superhero stuff but it's not so yeah there, the, I, I i've talked about this before and i'm sure you're familiar but the idea that like once you like what what book is your in book like everybody has that one like when you when you're growing up it's just mainstream comics because that's what you see on the rack and same with most people either some uncle gave you the stack of supermans or spider-man in my case or whatever and you, you went off to the races but then eventually you find that one like indie book that sort of you know kind of opens the world to you and realizes that there's worlds beyond just superheroes Mm -hmm. and uh i think when i was really young it was bone but then beyond that it was like um box office poison or like american splendor or those sort of things you know everybody has their own sort of way in so uh i need to look at those i mean i i actually i have to say i I don't don't i don't think i've ever even heard of those maybe bone i think i've seen but 
Uh, it's it was like a it was kind of aimed towards kids, but it's still a great oh. uh, it's a great graphic novel. It's just sort of um, it's it, like Scholastic picked it up, and now it's like been scholasticized in the smaller books. But um, Box Office Poison is a very interesting one, especially if you kind of grew up in the comic world, or at least you're discovering it now in that indie comic scene from like the late nineties, early two thousands. It sort of explores that through people involved with that. I had the guy uh, on the show actually that uh, that did it, and it was uh, it was pretty cool because it was neat to you know meet someone that had sort of an effect on your your life growing up. Okay. So uh, what were what were you reading growing up? Like you said, you're reading books. What uh, what was the what were your uh, authors? I was chewing through stacks of Hardy Boys in the third grade, and then nice. or uh, in like the fourth, I was pretty into him, and then I I I don't want to talk too much about my teenage taste in books because it was pretty bad. Like I had a <laughs> Lancy, uh, which I regret now. But um yeah. you know it gotta go start somewhere. Right. Yeah. Well, did you start writing then like as a teenager? <clears throat> oh I, I the first story I ever wrote was like when I was five and it was about me being abducted by aliens when I was taking out the trash. So I started early with the weird stuff and then I took over the spaceship and brought it back as I as I recall the plot. So um yeah, it's it's been a lifelong thing. I don't feel like I really started taking it super seriously until 28 or so. Like I kind of realized it's actually kind of an interesting, bizarre story. Yeah, that's what we're about. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to rewind it. So, okay, my father-in-law was married to this Swedish lady. Okay, uh -huh. it's out they get they're getting divorced. Turns out she's married to this other do dude the whole time. Right. Oh. And she's scamming his social security, basically. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. So got divorced. And then they found out that she was, they weren't actually married. And then because he she got was cancer. Married. And the Swedish lady starts claiming she's the surviving spouse. For re basically because her lawyer is uh, a moron. Yeah. Like, a deep, deeply, like, he's so stupid. He didn't <laughs> yeah. have, he's a family law lawyer that thought you could be married to two people at the same time. Right? Oh. Like. He's dumb. Yeah, I see. And I, like to the point where people would not believe me. They're like, no way. You can't possibly be that stupid. I had to explain to him, you can't be married to two people at the same time. He's dumb. Anyway, <laughs> so point being, like, uh, my aunt brings in her friend who was the, I she was the lawyer for Charles Schultz and like Winona Ryder and a bunch of other celebrities. Like she's no a lawyer. So she's out there billing probably four figures an hour. And she's like mentoring me as I write this summary judgment brief. And she's brutal. Like, and it was kind of at that point where I'm like, I don't know. I realized how much work it would actually take to write a novel. Really like really get in and do it. And that was kind of where I grew up. I think, you know, in a lot of ways was, uh, was that lady being disappointed in me and me having to come back and figure out how to get better. Um, so that kind of unleashed me as like serious, uh, seriously trying to get published. And then uh, I wrote, I The Walking Dead came out and I really love zombies. I have a whole thing about how zombies are actually terrible monsters because they don't have any agency, but that, I still love them anyway. No, oh, yeah, I, I understand that 100%. I'm a big zombie guy too. Yeah, uh, they, they're so bad. They're so lame. You know, yeah, again, it's funny when you listen to like, you know, intellectualists that like, or just movie people snobs that are like really in, because I'm a big movie guy and like people that are really into like, you know, what Romero was doing. And then they're like, well, Romero made this like, you know, anti consumerist concept and, or it was all like about race from the beginning. And then you talk to like interviews with George Romero and he's like, oh, no, we just like, he's like, the first one's about how people are terrible about working together in a crisis. Like humans are just the worst about trying to get along. Like that's what the first movie's about. And then they're, and then they're like, you just reading into this because the lead character is a black character and you're like yeah but it, it's just funny because people like read so deep into stuff that maybe it wasn't there well uh, initially the 60s isn't casting the, a black guy as your lead sort of a political statement in and of itself really that's what people that's what the the counter argument to most people say is it's like whether you intended it or not the sheer act of doing it had had created the uh well the I mean, sometimes you do things as a writer and then later on you're like oh wow that was that was really symbolic. Holy shit. And you didn't know you were doing it, but you, yeah. you were. But I mean, like Dawn of the Dead is kind of ex a perfect example of the problem, which is that the premise and the story are always pulling themselves apart, right? Because mm -hmm. if four people can take them all, a 300,000 square foot facility, clean it out of zombies and then protect it indefinitely with like some trucks, how the hell did they eat everybody? 
like they either the story is ripping apart the premise because the zombie apocalypse doesn't work or you know the premise is like how are these people possibly alive and that tension is why they always end up with like some random human showing up to be the villain and bring things to a climax is because you can't have your characters be too smart or you're going to unravel the premise and you need something to end it and the zombies just can't do that i mean like the chain link fence that they've been hinting at will fall over fine but you know yeah. there's there's no drama there yeah it's uh, all it's always the the third act uh the humans are the real monster sort of revelation yeah. which is like well we all knew that you know yeah, like, that's they act not... like that's the point no the point is you can't finish the fucking thing without, yeah exactly right yeah. i mean my take on storytelling can be very uh i don't it's different i guess but uh hey that's different i'm a huge fan of different so you're and, gonna and, love swat no, sweet. I'm curious. like it, it, it's uh it, swats i mean it's my baby i'm so proud of it i really mm -hmm. am it is uh, it's the it's the greatest thing i've ever written for sure and i'm just it's it's it, it is off the wall i mean it is playing with all kinds of tropes and inverting them subverting them all the time um and, well, tell, and me about the, tell me about the premise then since we're getting into it um cause at this point uh like because i know i i know enough about it just through uh i was actually curious what i was talking to you because i was like wonder how, how private this guy is because like there's not a lot about you online so like just to google you or, or you as a writer and even a description on another site was like he lives somewhere he reads comics <laughs> and then like and i was like yeah huh, okay so i'm curious how like open this this fellow will be to talk to yeah, I mean, I obviously you are but i hate writing bios i yeah. mean you know and i don't really i i should be more into getting attention online but i just i don't know you know i'm old enough that we grew up wanting mm -hmm. to hide our identities online it's oh, yeah. hard for me to like post everything and also i just kind of don't care if you like me or not to mm -hmm. some degree not you in particular oh yeah like, i know yeah not trying to score points or make yeah. anybody jealous <laughs> or something so i don't know social media this doesn't do much for me but that's the interesting part about it to me is that uh, if you are a creative type, like if you're uh, especially an independent creative type, like you're writing or you're you're doing drawing comics, whatever, you need to like you honestly in today's market have to be like almost like a marketing department yourself just to get your shit out there. Yeah, and it's so much work and so much you and uh, like I, I do. I'm a graphic designer and I, I've done comics and stuff in the past, but just indie indie things, nothing big. And, uh, you know, so even just promoting other people, like you got to get yourself out there so much. And it's, uh, it's just, it's like a full-time job on top of just creating. It's like hard to do both. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a whole package. Um, I mean, I don't, I, most podcasts I enjoy doing, I, I mean, I really do enjoy talking with people and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I have a problem with that. I don't have, I mean, if anything, I'm probably an oversharer. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever told anyone that big of a story in a long time. <laughs> um, and that's a pretty weird lead in a podcast probably, but, um, I don't know. It's just I don't know, social. It, it is, it, it's the whole thing's hard, but I mean, even, even as hard as it is in comics to like get attention or traction or anything, I still like it way better than prose publishing because you were just like a slave begging for attention over there. You know, they mm -hmm. treat you like crap because they know there's 10,000 people behind you that'll take your spot. And so they will just exploit you and then ask you to smile while they do it mm -hmm. and think that they're, you know, uh, yeah. So I was not a huge fan of that world. Um, I ended up, I kind of ended up in the uh, kind of the bottom end of Amazon. The, mm -hmm. you know, how like 10 years ago, there were all those, like, I don't know if, I think it was changing, but there was all those like skeezy publishing companies that were just churning out garbage on the mm -hmm. Amazon for Kindle. Yeah, I got roped into that for a while. And I think they, you know, John dies at the end. Yes. That, that, that was a book that they published, that company published. And then I think they re thought, hey, if we grabbed all of the intellectual property rights for everything that we published ever since then, eventually we'll get another John dies at the end and we'll get a payday. Because mm -hmm. they were trying to grab 90% of the intellectual property rights for everything that they were publishing. Wow. And they weren't paying you shit. There were no advances or anything. It was just pure you know pathetic exploitation because i mean honestly how how lame do you have to be to be trying to take advantage of me you know and the other <laughs> writers like sell some nfts or something christ well there's a whole new thing a friend of mine sent me an article it was an interesting one about um what the new grift is with those amazon things because now with ai basically they just like they 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 look at what the top 
coloring books for kids are right now and say it's dinosaurs. So then they'd get AI to make images of dinosaurs. And and uh, and all you got to do with the Amazon publishing is just upload the pictures for each page and they, they put it together and send it off to whoever orders it. So they just make this super cheap thing that is AI made with just uh, raw, like the dinosaurs look wrong if you look at these books because it's AI. So like mm-hmm. the Tyrannosauruses have like real arms that are way bigger and like, you know, they, the, the, the legs are weird. The tails are different. Some that don't look like the type of dinosaur they're supposed to be. Like a Triceratops has more horns than it should. All that sort of stuff. And uh, and then they just get, I don't know, Chad GPT to write the, the to write whatever blurbs they want to write in there about the book itself and then just send it off. And it takes like probably half an hour to do the whole thing. And they just try to rake in as much as they can because people buy them not knowing they just want a, a cheap coloring book for their kid off Amazon. And mm-hmm. then, uh, you know, the kid and, and and truth, the parents probably don't care when it arrives. They just give it to the kid and the kid colors wrong dinosaurs. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's just that's the new thing. And it's it was pretty pervasive. Like a lot of people have made a decent chunk of money, you know, essentially ripping people off doing it that well, way. Well, I mean, I. I know it. <laughs> the the thing the AI is, is that I feel like I mean the, the idea is to find the most probable like next step, right? So yes. it, it, if anything that's doing this interesting, like weird dinosaurs, is an accident because it's not good enough yet, and then eventually it'll just be mediocrity, mm-hmm. right? Yes, like once it's actually make yeah. You know, so you, I don't know. I mean, it's weird. I don't want to. I don't know. I'm an English major. What the fuck do I know about AI? Right? But <laughs> no, it's uh, an interesting conversation. Terrifying, you know, yet also like I think oh, you know the dead internet theory. No, it's a they call it a conspiracy theory, and I don't know if it's just me. I don't know why it's conspiracy theory. It just seems pretty accurate. But the idea is that basically the internet's mostly bots at this point, mm-hmm. and it's just mostly crap. And I feel like that's pretty true, right? Like over half of the internet traffic is bots already. Um, but with AI, it's just going to be fake memes. I mean, well, they're already fake, right? Mm-hmm. It's just going to be garbage. And I feel like if in, how do you, I almost feel like it's going to kill the internet, honestly, is it in a weird way? Because it's just going to be so useless, right? Yeah. I, I wonder that when you get to the point where bots are marketing towards bots and they don't know, you know, like, I mean, it's, it may, it's maybe happening already, but uh, it's just so wild in in that way. And uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I guess, more of a stoic in that it's just like, it is what it is. You change what you can, you accept what you can't. But the idea that, uh, you know, like everything's going to hell more so now than it ever was. I don't know. I don't know if AI is going to make more than it ever was, yeah. but relative relatively yeah i mean i read a lot of history this is not i mean like the black plague's worse if you need something <laughs> yeah, yeah worse there's plenty of times and in, in places where it's worse than what we're going through but that doesn't mean it doesn't suck or that we couldn't be doing a lot better yeah you know? i agree and that's so. it when like people and it's also like you you have to try you know is what i always say like when people talk about the environment or something and they're like well you know no matter what we do, China is going to keep doing what they do. It's like, well, can't we at least try? Like, can't we at least, you know, positions are actually down. I'm they, good. They, they, I'm glad. Oh, so, yeah. The uh, that's the argument you know, most people say, and it's like, shouldn't we still be trying? Like, yeah. maybe we'll develop something that they'll adopt, and it'll make everything better. Like, who? Let's keep trying. Like, yeah. I mean, the, the this the what about thing is is pretty standard move, right? Like. Mm-hmm. You complain about racism here, but it's way worse in Iran. Okay. <laughs> okay. And if I went to Iran to complain about it, they'd say, go home and fix your own shit, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's, I mean, other people being jerks is not an excuse for being a jerk. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So It's a very easy way to rationalize your own shitty behavior and just be like, well, someone else's is worse. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Nova Scotia is nice. It's it's a pleasant area. It's you know it's very yeah. very warm here right now. Um, so you know it's a good time of year. Yeah, it's uh you know winters are a little different probably than your area, but uh, you know they're still they're still no, there's definitely a lot different now. Yeah, like, I used to get snow. I don't really get snow anymore. It's uh, leveled off a lot here too. Yeah. Well, anyway, tell me about the book because uh, it's like, yeah. what what is it like? Harry, <laughs> I remember the log line I read that I liked was like, uh, what was it like a, a a grown up like not shitty? It was like yeah. a grown up uh, messed up Harry Potter. Yeah, kind it's kind of kinda, uh, I guess basically it it's sort of what if Harry Potter wasn't the chosen one? He was just a kid who survived a school shooting. 
and mm-hmm. is really fucked up by it. <laughs> um, like really, it's that's the so it, it is a parody, you know, and it started out that way, and then it kind of took on a life of its own, you know. Um, so it's kind of like the Venture Brothers, I think. Nice equivalent to Harry Potter, right? Did like, you have a reverence for Harry Potter at all before that? Before working on a project like this, or reference? Um, re- reverence like you liked it i read the six first six books and i saw all the movies i was never like a potter head mm. i mean i was just too old right i was like 20 when that came out so i yeah. ya things not gonna click with me the way it would if, if i was 10 yeah uh, you know like back to the future is more my childhood obsession level chr- chronologically um but i mean I, it was fine i enjoyed it it was it was you know, I saw why it was popular, right? Mm. Uh, and if I, I, you know, there were definitely some flaws to it, but uh, JK's really kind of soured the whole thing unnecessarily, I think. But whatever. Yeah. Her, uh, she has like a super yacht or something, like one of these, like, costs like $2 million to keep it on the water, like every month or something kind of yachts. And uh, oh. if it's uh, uh, in Nova Scotia, where I'm at, there's Halifax is the major city. And, uh, it the, the harbor has like quite a few boats and cruise ships and stuff that come in so uh, they just had a jazz festival there and when we were there watching um killer mike from run the jewels was performing and we were there watching him her boat is parked on the yacht so you can see it and it's fucking crazy dude it's like a it's like a rolling five-star hotel like it's in like about the size of one it's insane like a, uh there's been some fun meme pictures of local people like taking pictures of it with trans flags and whatever you know that or you know around it but uh it's uh it's it's insane yeah. the level of the wealth of that woman like you think about the theme parks the books the movies the comics the games the new series coming out i think they're doing like a tv series it's readapting it so like it's just oh, I've heard of that. going on forever man this train keeps rolling yeah yeah i i just find it very strange that a woman who hates it when people present as the different gender started writing under an androgynous name and then switched to a man's name mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. odd and then and, and there's some interesting stuff about that i don't know how purposeful it was but i guess like the 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 name she chose as her pen name for her like mystery novels is like a a person that is well known for being like very anti uh like trans stuff in history and then like in the first book like the vi- there's some kind of like i think the villain is like a trans person and they like really make it out like it's some deep mental problem to be a, a trans person so uh wow. it's just like it's it's like you're really just going all in it's almost like uh what's her face from the mandalorian like instead of just shutting up and realizing that maybe the world you're in right now isn't a world that's accepting of that behavior you're just going to go for the nines and be like i'm going to burn this mother down yeah I, I it I, it reminds me of you know those professional homophobes that end up getting caught with a dick in their mouth. Oh you know, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, not protest too much. Like this is too much. You you care about this way too much. Oh yes, yeah. You know? There's uh, any any and every crazy like uh, mega church pre preacher is usually the one that's caught with some weird sex thing, you know, yeah. and they're like from and usually it's a gay thing, and it's just like maybe you should just be you, man. Maybe you know instead of. But to me, it's so wild that you could be like, even in the States, like in, I don't want to make it all about the States because we have our own problems here, believe me. But um, like the whole thing about the abortion rights and all that. And then they're like somebody, you know, like how many of those senators paid for abortions do you think in their lifetime? But they are just pandering to their base, you know, to, or or, it's just wild to me that you could be that hypocritical, that knowledgeable of how crippled you are and still, go about doing the thing you're doing like free of conscience or at least not bothering you enough to not do it it's crazy like it's just insane to me i get people like money and people like to stay in their position or they are in their their life but uh i just couldn't get over the 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 sheer hypocrisy of it it's 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 wild well there's any number of anti-abortion activists that got their abortion but that was different yeah their situation was different. Yeah. Yeah. That was really, yeah. Intense. it would have been, a, it would have been a disaster for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's right. That's right. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. But I don't think it's really about, it's not about, it's never pro life. They don't give a shit about that. No. Right. It's always, it's control. They would whenever put a lot they, more money into healthcare and... Women and actually like reducing abortions. They pick control. Yeah. You know, if you gave them sex ed, they wouldn't get pregnant and then they wouldn't need an abortion. But we can't have that because then they'd be able to do what they want. Yeah, right? exactly. Always that, you know, so it's it is very. 
anyway, so Swan's great. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it, so it's, it's like a, like a secret police squad of people that investigate wizarding Secret crimes? Christmas Vault name is what nice. it stands for. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and then, um, there, I mean, basically there's like, in this world, there's basically a wizard assault team in every major city that's constantly nice. like policing the monsters. And the monsters have hunting tags, basically, where they get so many kills per year. And it's, they're coexisting, right? Because uh, they can't quite kill each other, so they've got to figure out a way to like exist. So uh, monsters have a quota they're allowed to kill within yeah, the, like, within within the law for, tags, like, for nice. deer, right? And if they go over their bag limit and they get caught, they get executed. Nice. It's, uh, it's a brutal system, but um, you know, so there, there's a lot of interplay with that, and I mean, it, it, Larry is a morally ambiguous character, right? He's not a standard hero. Uh, in a lot of ways and it's because of how, i mean given his job it's he's very traumatized and he basically is just like i'm going to shoot first so that i shoot first die last is his motto um you know so it, it's sort of some brutalized millennials trying to survive until they can get their pension is pretty much what it starts out as and then it gets so weird but i can't tell you without it getting you know spoilery yeah how it gets but you will not see the ending coming from a mile away. That's awesome. So what's yeah. that, what's out on the kick? Uh, not Kickstarter, but whatever the 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 group. Zoop. The it's cr- on Zoop. Z o o p dot g g. Which I mean, frankly, yeah, it probably was not a great idea for me as a new writer to go to a relatively obscure crowdfunding site because I think it's kind of slowing things down. But. Uh, it I mean, seems like it's one that's really geared towards comics, though, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, they. I think they have the occasional board game, but it's almost entirely comics, which I thought was going to be a positive, but it's kind of hard to get people to... I mean, I constantly have to explain what it is, which is probably not great, because I'm having to explain myself, the comic, and the website at the same time. It's just like... <laughs> but, um, you know, it's there. We've got a lot of options. We've got some cool... Uh, we've got a temp te- or temporary tattoo. We're doing... Um, uh, bookmark and we're doing trading cards as sort of add-ons and then uh you know there's signed editions of the comic there's a poster you can get a commission uh a commission drawing from rachel no nudity um you know and, oh yeah and we're actually adding uh you get 10 free pdfs of, of various other people's comics oh, uh cool. that's, that's a great, uh, that's a great option yeah so hopefully that'll i need to start advertising that more actually um but yeah so um, but it's, it, 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 it's, it's what we do in shadows meets the wire, but it's also got a, a lot of, a lot of heart to it. It really, I mean, I'm very proud of it. It's, it's, it's not, uh, I, I don't think I've seen anything like it in comics, uh, honestly. And I mean, I've read a lot over the last three years and I don't, I'm not trying to knock other comics, but it is very much my weird, my weird vision um and uh i i yeah so. no it's great i think it's it's i love those sort of things and it's funny because every once in a while there's so there's such a rare mashup of like um like cthulhu mythos or like magic stuff in a modern day setting uh there's there's not a lot of them and i've, I've mentioned on this show a few times about um this movie this hbo movie called cast a deadly spell that came out in like way back when, and it was uh, Fred Ward from like Tremors, and he plays like a detective in a world where, like a fifties noir detective in a world where magic is real. So there are ogres, there are elves, fairies, wizards, whatever, and uh, he's like refuses to use magic. It's just sort of his personal mantra. Um, mm-hmm. But then other people around him do, and he's trying to solve stuff. And uh, it was a, a cool HBO movie. It was pretty dark, um, but it was like a really cool. His name was I think Harry Lovecraft. Was like the, his name, uh, of course. So uh, that that was a neat one. But then, like, they put on something like Bright, that Will Smith movie, and I was like, ah, I didn't really care for that. I don't know if it's just more so David Ayer, the guy that made it. I'm not a big fan of him, but uh, you know, the idea of those mashing up those two worlds is always a really fun one. Like, this is what magic our world is like if magic was real and people were allowed to just sort of you know traverse that world along with their own. Yeah, it's uh, I haven't quite. Fa- I basically I in this world. It's like people know what they don't know, mm-hmm. right? And like the wizards all think, well, half the TV shows are about us and the stuff we're doing. So obviously everybody knows, but everyone mm-hmm. else is like, 
what? I don't know. It's it, uh, I, it's I, not I, like a Men in Black situation where they just wipe everybody's memory or something. Like no, that. they just like you know, nobody's gonna believe you. Fuck off, and then move on, um, or whatever, uh, or just they don't seem to think about it at all. So, uh, but in this world, uh, I mean, it's it's a bit different than than standard stuff because uh, it's it's not magic words. You know, you're not just like going. I don't whatever they say in Harry Potter when they shoot their wands and then, you know, it's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. It's, uh, it's hermetic magic. So they, it's just, you can alter reality by the power of will alone, but if you do it too much, the universe kind of snaps back and gets revenge. Right. No, oh, I uh, like that. That's a nice angle. You can only push it so far. Yeah. So that helps with keeping things, you know, well, why didn't they do that that way or whatever? Right. I mean, cause the thing with magic of course, is that, um, it's really hard to get right, mm. you know, because if it's too much, then no, there's no drama. And if it's too rules based, it gets boring. Like, mm. I mean, for me, that <laughs> Brandon Sanderson series where they're eating metal. Yeah. I got so sick of hearing about what mix of elements that guy is drinking. Shut up. I don't care. <laughs> Just right. drink the potion oh. and do yeah. the magic thing. Jesus. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it's like I'm supposed to keep track of whether, what beryllium does. No, sir. No. <laughs> I'm not. Especially if it's like a big important thing at the end. Like, you know, oh, the beryllium. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Thank God I drank that. It's yeah. Like, what about you? Yeah. You got it's got to be fun. It's got to be loose, but it can't be to the point where it ruins, you know, the story. So you've got it's it, it's definitely a very, it's a completely unique take, I think, on that. I've never seen anything like it on as far as magic goes. Um, you know, and, uh, it's just kind of, it's just, it's, it's worth, it's worth buying it. Nice. I'll say, you know, awesome. I mean, it really, um, mm, I, if I told you how much I believed in it, really, I think you'd think I was a lunatic. So no, uh, it's, I'm, I love it. I love seeing the passion of people on their projects. I mean, you got to promote your, your shit, but if you truly believe it, like it, it really bleeds through and I'm, I'm totally getting that for sure. Yeah. I, so. Yeah. I, 100%. I am, uh, I am on board with it. Um, Mm. I for for example, uh, the, the one of the villains. He's kind of a minor villain, but I, he's kind of fun. He's called Co- Count von Zollen, and he's a goblin slash accountant slash pirate that sails the high seas, auditing people to steal their stuff. Right? It's awesome. Um, you know, and that's that's just one of the weird. You know, it's 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 off the wall. I am just going. I'm venting twenty years of frustrated creativity all at once. You know, and it's just it's a. Uh, a fire hose of of references and nuttiness it's um that's yeah. awesome well do you ever do you ever like uh like lovecraft like was he a some kind of somebody that you were into a lot growing up i see that it's I, elder- oh yeah i i discovered hp lovecraft in when i was on vacation in honolulu so i was reading his stories on like waikiki beach nice it was <laughs> at the time i'm like this is bizarre what why am i reading this this is a mood this is the wrong mood but he's awesome. I, I mean, he's great. Um, I mean, his power is the thing with him is that the reason you can't imitate him is because he's bad, right? Yeah. Like, in, in a lot I've of often ways, heard it said that his concepts far away is actual ability as a writer. Yeah, I mean, well, the, it's on a technical level, like he can't really do dialogue. Every character is just him, mm-hmm. right? White science nerd from New England. Yeah, that's. If there's a woman involved, it's because a white science nerd from New England is possessing her body or mm-hmm. something like that, right? And it's always an epistolary format. But what he can do is convey the crippling anxiety that kept him living in his aunt's basement mm-hmm. to you somehow. <laughs> I don't that's know. That's a how- great way to word it. That's a really good way to word it. But that's his magic power is that he can make you feel like with Call of Cthulhu, right? I mean, this is as far as I figured that one out. You start out, you are reading the story of the nephew telling you about the time he read his uncle's files. Mm -hmm. And the uncle is telling you about the interviews that he did with like Inspector LaGrange or whatever. So there's like four layers of mediation between you and what's happening. And then they strip it. Yeah. Until it's you at the end that's the holder of the secret. And that's kind of how it works. But you should not try that. That is, Mm. that's... uh, I, I just kind of view him as like a savant, right? You just can't. Yeah. Um, 
There's a book by uh, John Barth. Um, what's it called? I want to say it's Welcome to the Monkey House. That's not right, because that's a Kurt Vonnegut book. But there was some book where it's a bunch of different short stories. And a guy that used to run a, a local bookstore that I used to frequent a lot. October Country? To... Pardon? Are you talking about October Country? By John Barth. It's a bunch of short stories. Oh, I thought you meant Heinlein. Never mind. No, no, no. It's uh, John Barth's his name. Uh, B-A-R-T-H. But it's he did a story where it starts off a guy telling... A quote like a, it's it, the quotes go deeper and deeper and by the end of it there's like 50 quote lines because it's like a quote within a quote within a quote within a quote and it goes all the way down and then goes all the way back out at the end of the story it's just it's more of an exercise in in writing than it is an actual story but it's very interesting and uh i feel like when you get deep into the weeds and stuff like that you can you can you can find some interesting stuff it's funny how you read um that in Hawaii, because I went to Cuba uh, just recently for vacation with my wife uh, back in April. And uh, while sitting on the beach, I read The King in Yellow, which was like oh, the yeah. book. Yeah, because I, I watched uh, True Detective finally. And that was that book was a big part of that first season. And I was like, and I had the book and I was like, I had to read this. So I read the, I read the whole book and I, I could see how because he was a big inspiration for Lovecraft. And I can see where Lovecraft got the idea of that, you know, the vibe of that dark thing beyond periphery outside of reality. That's sort of uh, one where there's the weird monster that's like having sex with everybody. No, it's the one. It's like there's a there's a book called The King in Yellow that like affects yeah, different I, people I, I in different ways. I yeah, I, I did read. I read it because of True Detective too. Yeah, there's like a pool that like a guy could like made this liquid that would turn anything into a marble statue that he dropped into it. And there's another guy that was yeah. There's another guy that was like convinced that there was someone following him all the time, and it's a lot of. Uh, a lot of interesting sort of concepts. The idea of suicide booths, like from Futurama, was sort of created in that book, which is really interesting. It's like the, the first story is like a weird near future where they have these booths where you can go in and kill yourself if you wanted to. So, okay. uh, yeah, there's some interesting stuff in there. I feel like I, I'm gonna, I, I thought I read it, but nothing you're saying is ringing a bell. So I'm gonna have to go see if I actually read it. The book itself is, uh, and there's like one about a book, a guy that finds a book that's the, the King and Yellow book and how it drives someone crazy and like paranoia and all this sort of stuff. It's very similar, but like the book itself, the full book, I think there's only four stories that evolve around this book, this King and Yellow book. The rest is other unrelated things. So the version I have is just those four short stories together. I'm going to say that this is, that, that same guy wrote a story where like there was this succubus thing that was like a monster from beyond space and time in England, like sleeping with everybody. And then is they, that life force, the movie yeah, life force. Like they, she sucks their life force. Right. Yeah. And then they, they catch her and they threatened to expose her sexual problems. And so she kills herself. And I'm like, if I were a weird succubus monster, I'd just be like, blow me i'll fly to i'll <laughs> fail the leads right you know like how how weird sexually do you have to be to think a, a creature like that would be like oh you got me yeah oh yeah yeah you got now, me this is bizarre it was truly like you were the most victorian person i've ever read my god i uh, love the i love that idea well that sounds a lot like the the toby hooper movie life force the one with the, the weird vampire thing that's going around sucking the life force of all people in london it's this uh, naked woman yeah might be this kind of the same idea. Um, I think I think that ends in a big old fight with a big space vampire woman thing. Yeah, but, that makes uh, more sense than than guilting her into quitting. <laughs> yeah, but, her too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. You're right though. That would be in a very repressed Victorian way. Like, madam, we will we will expose your secrets, your sexual gratuities. It's like, oh shit! Well, yeah. I, I guess I'll just kill myself then. <laughs> it was very like, okay, all right, yeah, uh huh. Um, but yeah, no, Lovecraft is cool. I mean, yes, he was. Yeah, he was racist as shit. But oh yeah, yeah. It's it's not. You don't have to read too far between the lines to understand that the the weird fish people were Jewish people, and you know, like and all these other things. Um, he was growing out of it. I think I read. I've read his letters. Is where I, I think that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he still would have been probably racist as shit, but he was getting better. I think. It's but, crazy to me about like because I just got a book recently of uh, I'm a big Kurt Vonnegut fan, and I just got a book recently of like a bunch of his letters he wrote to random people for whatever reasons, and like it's insane the level of and I feel like that's a lost art in general amongst people and writers that like how beautiful his just regular letters are like to some person that he knew growing up like hey things are going well but just how well they're written like like so much the thought that goes into these personalized letters to these people yeah like a bygone era. 
I mean, you just don't do anymore. No. I mean, emails just don't have the same thing. Right? Yeah, and, even just a text now. It's like, we good? You know, <laughs> question mark. <laughs> it's, it's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. I can see why women sort of, uh, well, certain women certainly uh, uh, romanticize the the days of the, the 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 long love letter, you know, the flowery sort of declaration of their love in, in printed form. Or uh, or anybody really just you know notes from home you know you watch movies where it's like people at war getting notes from home and stuff like that it's 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 a, it's a kind of a bygone loss sort of sort of art yeah it really is mm. so is it the, so what is it like working with um so is this like your first printed comic like I mean you've been writing a few have you did short stories is your first own thing yeah this is well this is the second series that I've written I've written all thirty six issues so mm. it's oh wow it's, okay um. I've actually started the sequel, gotten four issues deep on the sequel twice, mm-hmm. and I started the third attempt at the sequel yesterday. Nice. I, but yeah, I did do Edge of Darkness. Uh, that's my first series. Hopefully, we're going to be kickstartering that in September. Uh, that's a completely different vibe. It's um, humanity's been living under the underwater for millions of years, like beneath the edge of darkness, which is the mm-hmm. line where no light penetrates right in the ocean. Hence the name. Um, and so they like kind of live in these biological suits, like they a squid suit or a whale suit where they uh, sort of become the animal and then swim around in a uh, predator filled sea. Um, and they want to go find, they want to go see the sun. Like the sun's kind of their mystical, they, they worship the sun, but they haven't seen the sun and it's time to go back and, and, and find it. Uh, but everyone's too like, um, agoraphobic to ever even be out there because they are so scared you know like you you spend your whole life in darkness floating around in the open ocean is terrifying like it's terrifying enough for a lot of people these days um much less this one where there's just constantly giant predators that i mean the humans are prey basically Mm. right yeah i Um, think it was a spider-man comic one time jay Uh, i think um uh michael straczynski wrote maybe um when he was doing his run on spider-man way back when i think it was in high school but it was it was some like nod it, it set up stuff that got revisited in spider-man later with uh morlin the extra dimensional character that feeds on people's spider energy but he said uh, at one point spider-man did something that got like that got like some mystical thing and dr strange is like we're gonna have to be on on guard now now that you dip the toe into the this world the magical world they know you're there and he said that when you enter the ocean you enter the food chain and that line has always stuck with me forever because i love water um i love swimming but the ocean still scares me like it's a big you know crazy expansive we don't even know half of what's down there like it's it's yeah. it's wild and it's uh it's so alien it's like it's like an outer space right here on earth yeah i i it is uh i went uh i'm i I barely a scuba diver, but I went out to Gulf Shores and uh, did it. And uh, I, the first time I freaked out, man, like I was, I, I lift weights, right? So my gut reaction to everything is just lift, yeah. right? So I'm yeah, cold me too. So I burned through two thirds of my air supply just in the first 10 minutes because I'm just yanking on this rope like I'm in a strongman competition, freaking out. Um, but yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, the ocean's amazing. I mean, one time I was snorkeling and these two sharks whipped around a reef, you know, and they probably weren't that big. I was in no danger at all, but they looked like great whites to me. And so I just curled up in a, like a little ball and just didn't move and hoped they didn't eat me. Um, I didn't go as far from shore after that, but, um, yeah, I mean, the ocean's always been a, a thing that I, I always, you know, was fascinated by. I mean, I like to look at, there's the creatures down there are so weird, man. You know, oh yeah, I, I the light, uh, the way they use light down there is it's it's a warning, it's a lure, it's a decoy, it's it's everything. So it's even though it's completely dark, light is super. It's probably more more important down there in its own way because of how fair it is. Yeah, um, but no, anyway, that's, that's a great thing to explore in a in a comic. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that whole like you know the giant squid or like the the coelacanth for the things we thought were extinct that aren't are still around that they'll find one every once in a while and be like oh no they're still down there and you're just like oh you know what else is still down there so uh, it's cool oh, no, I, I I like it like I lift weights too um, I'm a professional wrestler is another side gig I do 
But um, the idea that like it doesn't matter how good you are, strong or how fast, it, uh, under the ocean, it doesn't matter. You're nothing. If someone wanted to kill you, the, everything is faster and and uh, you know, and, and uh, essentially stronger than you underwater. So what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, they've yeah. evolved to be there. So yeah, they're gonna. Yeah. They're gonna be but um, yeah, no, uh, uh, that's a that's a fun project. And then and then I segued into SWAT. I actually, I mean, the reason I even started writing comics was I just spent I just stalled out and i was so bored with this novel that i was writing that i just popped it open and started writing and it was just like a lightning strike of like i should have been doing this the whole fucking time that's awesome no i mean what I, did, I, that, I, did that persist when you started working with an artist because that's like a whole other can of worms right i enjoy writing comics working with artists can be a different story mm -hmm. but um the first guy i hired to do edge of darkness uh i'm not going to name names or anything but yeah, that's like, fair enough uh oh, yeah, this, this isn't a gotcha show it's just a yeah i, I yeah. wasted a year with that guy and he turned in the worst shit like just uh, it's terrible really um, so it, it's very frustrating because artists are kind of not usually the most together people it oh, seems. Yeah. um yeah. so there's yes. always there's always some story uh some ridiculous fucking story about why they aren't on hitting deadlines you know yeah very um, very uh like the most artistic people are usually the least coordinated people in life. You know, they can make maybe make some great art, but they're terrible at just, you know, answering the phone or or saying this, you got to be here at this time to do this. Hey, and the, then the guy, even the bad ones are that way, too. So, yeah, well, the, the guy that I ended up firing was he had a peanut allergy that was kept him from doing things. And then he got covid and then he he moved across country and his laptop was in the in the container that was being shipped. And it was just like. <laughs> you know um so yeah i mean this, but even uh, there are ups and downs to comics for sure and you know making it is uh a lot more you know there's definitely hurdles and stuff like that but um i, I i'm much more comfortable being an entrepreneur you know like than i am being a supplicant i guess so i mm -hmm. i can deal with the hurdles that come with you know project management much easier than i can like begging for someone to pay attention, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just logically. So, uh, but no, I mean, comics are awesome. I love the scene. I love all, most of the people who are in it. I found like, I finally found an audience that can, you know, will get it. Right. Um, I mean, there are some of these podcasts and I'm not talking about you at all, no, Sure, <laughs> uh, but uh, there are some people at the bottom tier of podcasting that should not be mm. have a podcast. Like that is just, I, I shouldn't be a horse jockey and you should not be in a charisma job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? Yeah. 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 hundred um, percent. But uh, well, know. that's it. I mean, that, well, that's also the word, the vibe. I mean, you know, I can't knock at other people doing it because I'm, I'm very much of their ilk, but like some people just don't have the, the ability to, you know, like I talked to one of my first discussions is with um, Ed Burson who writes for Marvel. I think he's doing the predator book right now. He actually mm -hmm. lives in Nova Scotia and I ran into him at comic cons. We were kind of friendly. So I had him on the show and he was just saying how he, sometimes you'll go on these, these podcasts and you'll talk to someone for about 30 minutes and then they'll be like, all right, well, we'll turn on the machine now. And it's like, cause they, they just, they just have an excuse to talk to the people making the shit they like. Right. And it's, it's like not necessarily, they're not approaching it in a way that, you know, does both essentially, which is what I try to do, you know, get to talk to yeah, people. I mean, yeah, I, that would, I wouldn't mind that nearly as much as I mind the, like a couple of weeks ago, I was on this like Howard Stern knockoff thing. Oh, really? Right. <laughs> if you watch the feed, you can probably see about 15 minutes where I go to check to see how many people's watching. And it's yeah. me. I'm the only <laughs> one watching and I'm putting up <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going on about like how January 6th wasn't that big a deal and blah, blah, blah. Oh, God. <laughs> but, okay. You know, and then there's this fucking guy over here who doesn't say anything, but every like couple minutes he, he has a whiteboard and he's doing these terrible, stupid cartoons with no artistic talent whatsoever. And he, it was just <laughs> like, ah, uh, uh, yeah, I still. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> So well, that, that that's another danger too, right? Like I, I kind of I think it's a safe assumption most artistic types are kind of left leaning, but you never know until you like when you're talking to someone because you don't want to like I'm you you know you don't antagonize someone that's nice enough to come on your show, but you're always kind of slightly worried. You're like, well, who knows what they're you know that you don't want to bring up anything that'll cause any issue. 
But now, uh, I'm perfectly fine with the podcast not getting political. I yeah, mean, it's way on yeah. there. But I'm perfectly fine with it not going there. But yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough when they they shoehorn you into it. Yeah, uh, yeah, because then you're just like, well, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? But uh, yeah, no, it's definitely not my appeal. I just try to. I like to, you know, I, I like this sort of casual conversation because it's almost like talking to someone at a party or something. You get to know what yeah. they like, learn about their project, and and get a feel for who they are as a person, right? Yeah. So no, that, I, this is this is this is definitely this is the kind of podcast they should all be. This has been yeah. good. Well, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and um, uh, one of the things, I mean, okay, so I see everything's a spoiler with mm-hmm. me. <laughs> well, don't, don't ruin too much, but I'll take I'll take whatever you want to offer. All right, so I mean, th- it, this is one of the jokes in the series. There's this gun called the Warrant, and it's just a Nerf gun with magic wand stuck in the end that shoots lightning. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it, it can be that silly, but it's also really intense. That's I mean, awesome. it opens with a basically i mean it opens on the day that columbine happened and with this, the school shooting that larry lives through where he kills his voldemort basically um morgana Le Fay is kind of his voldemort mm-hmm. and we just jump forward for a while but it, it really is ultimately a lot about that and uh kind of the tr- I, I, it's kind of the millennial experience of just sort of watching everything get shitty right like mm-hmm. the 90s really did a number on people's heads right there was mm-hmm. a point where tom clancy had to bring the japanese back for his geopolitical threat that's how safe we felt is we had to go back to the that you know um that's how i mean he that's how yeah and we all thought like everything was gonna be perfect forever and then it is not mm-hmm. uh you know that's kind of more of our delusion that history was over than than anything that was real, but it still has an impact. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's it, it's a kind of a millennial exhaustion feeling is kind of what I'm channeling. You know, like there's a lot of frustration and anger and tiredness um, that the characters are feeling that they have to work through, and you know, but at the same time, they they all really genuinely care about each other. Like it's a good. It, it's not a bunch of assholes sniping. It's not an always sunny. And th- well, they kind of care about each other. Yeah, they still care about each other in that show. I'd say it's more like a. They do care about each other. It's not a. It's not one of those where I come up with pointless or stupid conflicts, right? Where, like, I, I, I think one of the tropes of like, there's a certain type of British like drama where it's just twenty year olds and there's some sort of love triangle, but there's always a new third party on the mm-hmm. triangle. Yeah. Never quite get together. I hate that shit. Mm-hmm. You know, like I just take them three seasons before they finally do. And then it's the end of the yeah. show. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. When the rating not bump will, or drop, we'll, we'll get, have them get together, that kind of thing. But yeah. Um, but then it's like one night and then they have a fight and then they're not together for another season until they get together again. <laughs> it's always that. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't handle it. I mean, I just, I, I don't, I'm not interested, but, um, you know, they, they, they care about each other and it's the power, it's the fact that they are a genuine team that sort of helps them get through a lot of the situations that they're in. Also the magic murder bag. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. Well, that sounds fun too. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, so, this is a, a cool, man. This sounds like a really cool project. I'm really excited to check it out. Yes, please buy. Seriously. <laughs> like, it it it's it's one of those things i guess i don't know i feel like it's one of those where it probably looks like uh if you were glancing at it like yet another supernatural horror comedy and you're like eh. but it's not it's mm-hmm. just not um it's so much more um but uh yeah i mean uh, yeah awesome 24 page comic the first one uh, right here, lots of great. Uh, I'm just taking a look at the uh, at the the page itself with all the add-ons and rewards and stuff. A lot of great stuff. Yeah, the first four, six pages or six, seven pages are on there. Um, if you want to look at them, and yeah. that is a decent start. But like it, it's only it's only. I mean, the, the first three issues are great and everything, but it's not until issue four that things kind of go nuclear. Mm-hmm. As far as like that was a moment of. I started writing it and it was just pure inspiration. I'm just, I'm just sitting back and letting it happen kind of moments. Uh, I mean, it it was a genuine joy to write SWAT. Like I really, 
I'm glad I got to do it before I die. Whatever happens with it, whether it gets published or not or whatever, um, it's one of those things where it, it really was an experience for me that meant a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I, I, I think that carries through in, in, in the text and it will show up in the in the art as well or in the final product. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 something. Yeah, wow. that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, man. It's yeah. been a pleasure talking to you. Well, and, thank you. Uh, yeah, it was, it was good. I'll definitely be posting uh, stuff about it leading up to when the episode drops, which will be on Monday, but I'll send you a link when it's out. And uh-huh. uh, and yeah, definitely uh, keep the keep waving the flag, man. It's a really cool project. I'm excited to read it. So. Thank you. There it is, my chat with Justin Koch. Stay tuned to social media to find out who the next guest will be. I have an idea, but I don't like to announce it until it's recorded and in the can. Once it is, I will have it out there on the socials. And, you know, it'll just be dropping in your feed if you subscribe Monday anyway. And you're going to listen because you're a dutiful fan. You listen to the show. You dig it. You like what I'm throwing down. And it'll be more of that. So uh, be great chat, great conversation. Lots more to come as we zero in on episode 100. If I had more time, I would add some kind of an effect to that. But uh, thanks to Justin for being on the show. Thanks to all the previous guests. Thanks to all the future guests. And thanks to you for tuning in. I'm going to sign off now saying what I always say, which is uh, have fun, stay safe, and go read some comics, goddammit. The Graphic Histories Podcast is a proud partner of the United Federation of Podcasts. (laughs) 